One of the biggest and most complicated areas of the submarine is the command deck, the nerve center of the boat, built as a separate module in another part of the shipyard. The command deck module is 22 meters long and weighs 180 tons. It contains the navigational controls, sonar, communications and weapon systems. The captain's cabin is on the top deck, while the second deck is where food is prepared and the crew eat, sleep and relax. We put all the combat system together here, make it talk to each other, and then the boat gets, the CDM gets fleeted from here down to the submarine and inserted back in the submarine. This is called the sonar cab space. Various equipment's in here, the, the processing for the sonar, for the networks, for the command systems. I'll show you the sound room. This is where the sonar sets are. This is all the command system now, all the, the sonars and all the other equipments on board pass all their information across to these desks. Okay, carrying on aft. Um, this is the commanding officer's cabin. Again, at the moment, it's pretty bare. The captain is the only man on board who has a, a cabin to himself. He's, he's the sole occupant of this one. This is the, the lower deck of the CDM, which is mainly accommodation. There's 19 bunks in this space quite cramped, but nothing different to what uh, submariners are used to and have been used to for many years. When I was in the Navy, all we had was a bunk light. Uh, nowadays they have iPod chargers, they have all sorts. Okay, coming to the after end of the, the command deck now, we have both the junior eights and the senior eights messes. This is where they live when they're off watch as well. And the final compartment is the galley, or the kitchen, it's got every possible modern convenience, everything. I don't know, it's got more than my kitchen has. There's a little bit of finishing off still to do, um, but we're not far off completion, whereby this will then be transported down to the DDH and slotted into the submarine. Once the units are fully fitted out, they can be joined together. We're going right through this unit into the next unit, and we're going to go down the tank. A job for the welding team. There's always a one squad on nights, one squad on days, and we will be on the job until it's finished. It's hard work, I'm on my second t-shirt now. I'm sweating, I'm tired, and we're going to be here till about 7 o'clock today, so... We all have a section each, start at the same time, finish at the same time, more or less. And uh, hopefully the results are all the same. The welding's good. Compared to some of the spaces on this submarine, this space is big. This is my job down here. I've got to crawl down this gap and this ladder to get down. The job will take over two kilometres of welding to complete, so the team will have to work in unison with accuracy being key to ensure the units are in perfect alignment. The other side of that bulkhead is a nuclear reactor. Um, to the right, we've got the command deck module goes in this side. This is my gun. Press the trigger, and the gas comes out first. And you let go of the trigger, the, the wire obviously feeds out with the power going through it. If you get too hot, get too dry mouth, or lose too much fluid, you've got to come out. Heat-wise, it's the same everywhere. It's extremely hot wherever you are, as you can see. It's, no, it is hot. It's hard work. It is a hard job to do. It will take eight welders working day and night shifts, three weeks to join just two parts of the submarine together. And the tanks they work in can reach temperatures of up to 130 degrees. On a job like this, we'll be doing miles of welding, yeah. Absolutely. We use coils of wire, and I think they hold about 10 pounds of... Of wire, of wire on them and we can put then one, two in, in a shift easy. Mm. So th th there's a lot of welding involved. I take pride in my work. I think a lot of the welders do. Yeah, it's a bit of a challenge now and again, so yeah. yeah we have a challenge with each other as well though, don't yeah. you? I mean, um, when you're welding, you've got, you, it's got to be right. Have a bit of a laugh over it. Um, bit of a dig at each other, so you take pride in your work that way. Jed's worked in the yard 
uh, for about 25 years now. He left uh, school when he was 16 and went straight into the yard, left in the June and went in September. I like it because I think it's permanent, it's stable, you know, he's, he's got a good job there and he's home from work within five minutes. A welder's a very, very manual job, um, very dirty and he has to get into some sort of tight spots that I certainly couldn't get into, so... <laughs> Once the welding is finished inside, the team move to the outside of the hull to complete the job. It's quite an important job. If anything goes wrong with the job, it comes on my record. I did my first one of these, age 18. I think I'm the youngest one to do one. Yeah, quite proud of it as well, really. Uh, this is finished now. They'll crack detect it, then it'll get ultrasonic tested. This is just like a baby scan, really. Put jelly on it, put a probe over it, just to make sure there's no muck or defects in the metal. And then they'll x-ray it, just to further check it again, just to make sure there's lives at risk, so it's got to be right. Where there is a joint, there is usually a weakness. But in the case of the astute, the metal used by the welders is actually stronger than the hull. This innovative work is done on site by a team of scientists and engineers. In the mechanical test area, um, there are various pieces of equipment and techniques which allow us to uh, characterise the way materials behave, such as tensile testing, which you know we use to pull the material apart, or impact testing. When two sections of the submarine are joined together, we will have specify the materials that have been joined together. We will have developed the process which joins the material together and we will have assessed the suitability of the material that goes into joining the two pieces together. Boat 2 is ready to be outfitted. The vessel will eventually contain over 1 million components which includes 23,000 pipes and over 100 kilometres of electrical cabling. Just going to go into the workshop now, uh, go see Carl and see what the plan of action is for today. With a maximum of 290 people allowed on board boat two at any one time, the different teams need to work together. They will literally build her by hand. Uh, the job that we're doing today is going to be in the captain's cabin, so it's quite a small compartment. Fit in the PAM cabin, they are PAMs, personal air monitors. They need them for the gases, so there's gas leak, such as argon. Argon's like really dangerous, they say like two lungfuls and you can, it kills you straight away, so nasty. Before we go on board, the last thing we've got to do is swipe on with our passes. That's just so they've got like, they know how many people are on board, so that like if it's a fire, they know how many people will get off board and such things like that. Erin is one of 500 apprentices and graduates working in the shipyard. Apprentice schemes all over Britain are now being reintroduced to stop the decline of traditional skills. And this is especially essential for the survival of Barrow. This is the captain's cabin space. Mm -hmm. This is a call signal station. So if the power goes down on the boat and you can't contact other areas, this will have a handset on it. Like, it's just like a wind-up phone. Apprentices always work with someone already qualified, known as a journeyman. I basically get a step-by-step -step guide through how to do something until I've learned, like, until I'm confident I can do it myself. And then I do them on my own. But I've never done one of these before, so Carl will tell me what to do. These cables are going to be run into the tops of the terminals, which are connected to the bottoms of the terminals. And all these colours go up the side, and then they're all connected in there. And we've got blue and black, red and black, and then there's three white and black ones. And we'll be able to work out on the drawing which one goes where. So just them ones? Yeah. What next? Three and four. These are the first submarines we've built for ten years, and a lot of the skills have been lost. 
we had a spell where there was no apprentices coming through and we've had to start it all up again. And if you didn't have apprentices, you'd be struggling in the future. This is the big employer of the town and we need this to keep going. Good. All right, yeah. Sorted. Yeah, Erin did well. She uh, looks at it, she did well. Nice and neat, so good job. They opened it and there's loads of terminals and I thought, looks complicated, but once you read the drawing and understood it, it was pretty easy. While the teams continue to finish the inside, a very special process is beginning on the outside. The surface of the boat is covered with around 40,000 rubber tiles, designed to make the boat almost invisible. The rubber absorbs and then breaks up enemy sonar waves, stopping the signal returning and giving the astute's position away. This rubber blanket also gives added sound insulation, making the submarine even quieter. Each submarine will spend around five years inside the Devonshire Dock Hall before being removed and lowered into the dock outside by a massive ship lift capable of handling vessels weighing more than 16,000 tonnes. Once in the wet dock, the submarine can be fine-tuned and finished. storage department or torpedo room is where weapons are loaded, stored and fired from. The Astute is armed with spearfish torpedoes that have a range of over 65 kilometers and weigh two tons each and Tomahawk cruise missiles able to accurately hit targets more than 1,000 kilometers inland. However, as an attack submarine, the Astute is not built to carry the controversial Trident missile system. Today, the crew are engaging in a war game exercise to test that all the equipment is talking to each other correctly. The plan today is to run three scenarios. These scenarios will test all aspects of the system, both uh, physically uh, and the crew as well. It will test them as well. OK, listen up, guys. It's your brief, your task. You've been allocated to a patrol area in the Norwegian Sea with an assigned role of surveillance and intelligence gathering. You are to patrol the area and attempt to covertly trail any deploying submarines which you detect and classify. You are to maintain a fire control solution at all times whilst in the trail. If you detect the Delta IV preparing for a weapon firing, you are to conduct a simulated spearfish engagement, including water shots to ensure counter detection. You have two hours and 30 minutes to save the world. Weapon set rep, weapon set rep. What's dangerous submarine contact? The control room up here is where we prepare the fire control solution for, uh, for firing a weapon. And then down below in the weapon storage compartment or the bomb shop, uh, that's where we actually fire the weapons from. It's simply simulating the submarine um, actually being used for what it's intended. Classified Oscar. Stand by a spiffish attack. Take track 35 as target. Classified Oscar from 2 tube. Stand by a Valid active attack. contact. Classified Valid active Stand contact. Two. Weapon 2. Officers is also a squad board. Stand by bring tensions to conduct the attack on uh, this contact. Enemy stand reports. The command system uses its various algorithms to work out where we think the target's going to be. And then uh, once we've got a good fire control solution on the target, then we'll try and fire a weapon at it. Valid active contact bearing 146, range 10,700 yards. That is the target. Continue the attack. Roger, continue the attack. Stomach fire, track 3-5. Stomach fire, track 3-5. Camera stable bearing 146.